look, you know what, there are giants on the land. There's no way you could do it. Yet it was a dream God had placed inside all of them that God said to them, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to give you a land that is flowing with milk and honey. I want to say silk and money. Yeah. Milk and honey, right? Eh? I'm going to give you that land. God said so. Imagine you get a word like that from the Lord. And then they went all the way to that spot, all the way. And then Moses decided to, to, uh, to send out the spies. And the spies went out, 12 of them, and 10 of them came back with a bad report, saying, you know what, there are giants in the land and so on, and we cannot do it. They'll kill us, they'll kill our children, and blah, blah, blah. And God was so upset with them. But two of them, two of them, Joshua and Caleb. Caleb was the older guy. He was about 40 years old at that time. And he said, no, guys, we were able to do this. And he told Moses, no, what? give me this hill country. I want the hill country. And the hill country were the giants. That's where the giants were. You know, you, 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 when you ever want to do any kind of warfare, and if your enemy is on a hill, you're the sitting duck, you know. You have to, you have to climb up to that guy, and they can shoot and do things to you before you even get halfway up the hill. Climbing up the hill is one difficult feat. But this guy, he said, I want that hill. I want that hill country. Give me that part. Because everybody was, were given um, parts of the country. They refused to go in with all of that encouragement from those two. They listened to the majority. Majority not necessarily right. And so what God said, he said, okay, fine. We're going to go around the mountain. It took them 40 years. Now, 40 years later, Caleb is 80 years old. You talk about a dream and killing, dream killing roots. 40 years. 40 years later, now Caleb is again, as I said, is 80 years old. And he says to, I think there's hope for us, right? 80 years old. This guy says, suddenly he says to, the, to Moses, he says, um, yeah. I want that hill country, please. Maybe he said it differently this time. <laughs> I want that hill country. Give me that hill country. The dream, you know, you can't kill the dream. And he finally got it, of course. Strong, strong man. So what is a dream walker? walker? And I'm using the term as a person who is walking in his God-given dream. Now, I... You know, you can talk about Nike and all those other guys, and some of them may not be Christian. You can, you can learn from their stories, but they're not necessarily God's dream. Do you understand? Yeah, not necessarily God's dream. I'm talking about the things that are, the people that are called by him, that are called by his name, and are in this world, and God has placed something in you. It's, it may be spiritual, it may not be spiritual. But you are here and God has a plan. And you could be somebody who's inventing some, something for somebody in, in the wilderness somewhere. How to make water or make power happen. So I don't know, but God is able to, to help you in your dream, in the dream that God's placed in your life. You don't have to kill, be killed. I tell you what, there are many people that will kill your dream. And sometimes you get married to people like that. Hmm. So be careful. Watch who you get married to. Eh? Oh, Lord, help us. Let's look at this text in Ephesians 3, verse 20. It says, now to him, talking about Jesus, same book, Ephesus, that Sean was quoting from this now. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, May there be glory, it may be glory in, uh, be glory in the church. Be glorified. What's the next verse say? Verse 21. Glory to God in the church. There's a, and I've, that's the message Bible says. And the next verse says, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Go back to 20. Again, so God can do anything, the message says, you know. 
far more than you could ever imagine. That's why I'm talking about imagining the impossible. And then those things that you imagine, like I imagined myself being a doctor and then I entered, uh, you know, uh, classes for, for uh, St. John's Ambulance, yeah, to be part of that. And then it was a Red Cross, two different organizations I joined. This, this is really, we're still in school. Went there, went to classes, got the thing. And then I discovered that I didn't like the sight of blood. I, uh, somebody killed my dream, but rightly so, because I'm, I'm still a brilliant guy, I can tell. You can tell. <laughs> I said, ah, even now, I think about how logically some things need to happen in terms of medical, you know, whatever the, what goes on. I think, you know, I could have told them a couple of things. Maybe I would have been a serious inventor, you know, medically. You never know. I have that mind. I don't say that boastfully. I just, I just know, <clears throat> you guys. Yeah, you, you have to don't think of yourself highly, but God has given you a mind, hasn't he? Hello? If you're 80 years old, like what's so old Caleb, you can, you, can, you, you can still be strong in your mind and say, this is what I want in my life. And God is able, even at this age. I was thinking, one time I was thinking when I was 40 something, well, I, I could still be a doctor now, couldn't I? But I still didn't like the sight of blood. Every time there's an accident, I look away that way. I just can't handle it. It's too much. You know, bone sticking out or something like that. That looks terrible. So I thought, no, I think God put that in me. Don't go there. That's not you. This is you. Serve me. So God has placed in you a mind that can imagine. And God is able to do immeasurably more than you can ask or even imagine. Imagine that. That which you can ask, you can do more than what you can ask. That's why you must ask as big as you can. And God is able to even bigger than that. He's able to. So we know that God has given us a mind a mind to imagine, and faith in him works the same way. We imagine the impossible. Yeah, we, we dream the impossible. We, we envision the impossible. This building was not possible for us back then. We didn't have money. We had 40,000 in the bank, and I was gonna start this. We started this, 40,000. Paid for the land, paid for this, paid for that. Then I got somebody to do something here in this work. By the time I was done with some part of it, the money was gone. The foundations alone here, with all the bases, they got about 21 bases. Bases were like 1,800 square bases, so much concrete, steel, 32 mil steel coming out of it, all these pillars. It was 200 grand back then in the foundation, just the foundation. And there was not one brick and the people, some of them, one or two of them, was criticizing me at that time. And saying, where well, are you telling us this, that? You put a couple of bricks there, you're telling us this. We don't see anything. They are not here. They made shipwreck in their lives. They are the dream killers. But what you see is a dream realized with no budget. I can say, we did it. Hello? We did it. It's the, I think it's the best looking building in the city. I love you. This is sort of like excited people. I'm trying to like raise your faith level because you know, I think God needs it. You need, we need that. I need that during this time. I didn't need to believe God for big things. How about you? You might not have two cents to, you know, to your name, but I tell you, God is able. 
So in, when God created the world, imagine this thing about this God who's called us, who's able to do immeasurably more. In creation, God spoke what he had in mind to do. It is safe to assume that God had a vision. Like we imagine this building, we imagine this, that, and the other. He had a dream in mind before he actually went about doing it. I believe he wants all of us to exercise our faith, to believe him for the impossible. It's not possible. Some of the things that you're looking at now is like not possible. How is it going to work? But there's a God. A big dream, I believe, glorifies him. Glorifies God. Imagine Jesus with the disciples and the Lord. I talked to you last week about that. How he walked on the water. Can you imagine that? Impossible feet. Hello? Impossible. Walk on the water. And he actually made one guy do it. Amazing. Yeah, we all focus on the fact that he sunk. Yeah, you have dream killers. The situation, you think you can't, I can't do this. And then you will sink. But Jesus is near. So when he created the world, he didn't consult me, God. He didn't consult me. He was, he was here first, right? When he created the world, he knew me. He actually knew me before I was born. No, 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 no. He knew me before the world was born. Just think about his mind. Before the world was formed, he saw me in 1973 already. You are going to come to me. You are going to come to me. Your mother is going to pray like this. And you are going to come to me. And by 2021, this is where you're going to be. This is what's going to happen for you. Don't you think God's able? Well, God created the world out of nothing. It did not exist. It wasn't there. He spoke it into existence. Let there be and there was. Don't you think he can, he can give us his word like that and create something? where there's nothing, where there's chaos. I have to believe him. I have to believe this God because he's put a dream in all of us. He's this God who is able to do immeasurably more than I can ask or imagine. So he knew me. Then, then why? Then would I assume I can live my life without him? Why should I think that he, he I, you know, I, I can live my life Without him, this week, uh, sometime this week, one of the one of the mornings, I woke up earlier, that like two o'clock, and uh, you know, you, sometimes you can't sleep when you get up at that time, and so I was up at three o'clock. I wasn't out of my bed, but by three o'clock, and then the sermon is playing. This one is in my head. All thing, all these different scriptures, and particularly the one that I'm going to quote now, was playing in me. Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And then the word live became very big to me as I was thinking about it that hour in the morning, just thinking all the wide awake. And I thought, man, okay. Man will not live by bread alone. And put it another way, man will live by bread but he can't live by food or biryani alone. Hmm? He needs another element. He needs something else. Another something else to sustain him. He needs the word of the Lord. And he needs a word that comes out of the mouth of God all the time. He can't live out of the word that was spoken 19 something. Eh? It must come on a regular basis. I'm going to live because I haven't eaten 19 something and didn't eat again. I eat all the time. So too the word of the Lord. You stay away from the word of the Lord, the book, then you are shooting yourself in the foot. 
You see, because the dreams and the wisdom for the dream, wisdom is direction. How do you do? How do you do that? This, that, and the other comes from the word of the Lord. So why would I assume that I can live my life without an outside of God's word? How can I assume that I can live my life without God's word in my life? Now that I've become a Christ, a Christian person in Christ, hmm? I, need, I, need to, I need to align my life. It makes sense when I align myself to Jesus. I can't live my life like, uh, you know, on Sunday or some seasonal thing. I got to do it on a regular basis every day. I got to live my life. It doesn't have to be a pastor, but you have to live your life. You can't just eat food. You can eat food, you can be sustained, but if you're not eating from the word of the Lord, your spiritual life is not sustained. And that's the main ingredient. That's the place where dreams are forged. Those, that's the area that we need to take care of. You can eat all kinds of luxurious things, but if you don't eat the fat of the word of the Lord, you will not have the dream God's dream realized in your life. So you got to do some work there. It doesn't mean you go to Bible school and all that. Some people go to Bible school. Nothing gets into their head or heart. I'm talking about you and God reading like so. Like, for example, that morning when I got up, I'm thinking about the word of the Lord. You understand now, that was feeding me. You understand? The spirit of the Lord in me. You have it. I have nothing special about me. You also got him and the word of the Lord. And you know that word. Man will not live by bread alone. So I'm meditating on that. Man will not live by bread alone, by food alone. I also need to be sustained by the word of the Lord. Jesus speaking. In fact, he quoted that when the devil came with his food. And his way of producing the food. And I tell you, that's what the devil does to us today. He says, I will want to give you food my way. Even in the garden, you remember, man had sinned because of food. You remember? Food that was forbidden. God forbid it. But Satan took that food, which was forbidden, and gave it to man. And man disobeyed and he sinned, separated from God, plunged the entire human race, all because of eating food that is supplied by the enemy. So sometimes you think this God has blessed me. You must think again. You must ask again, is this blessing from God really? Or is it from the devil? Because the devil is a dream killer. So you might think, well, I got this, I got that, I'm, you know, I'm moving. Those things perish, man. Houses, lands, cars, everything, all, all go. Everything needs to be fixed up. And then after a few years, all rots, right? But the word of the Lord endures forever. Endures forever. You got that, nobody can take it away from you. Nobody. You can wake up at midnight and start thinking about what's going on with you and your life. And God can speak to you. He can give you wisdom can sustain you. See? That's the thing. So you, you grow. So our, in our new life in Christ requires a new diet, new ways to sustain this new life. That's the same God who says, I, I can do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. He's not talking to a non-believer. He's not talking to those people that are not Christian. He's talking to you, the children of God. So this new man in Christ needs spiritual sustenance. Here's another one that I was thinking about. In Psalm 1, look at it, verse number 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor st or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Huh? He, this man who delights in the word of the Lord like this, he is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff 
that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the, of the wicked will perish. How do, how do I walk in my dream? How do I become a dream walker? In my text here in Psalm 1, we are being admonished, counseled. And it says, do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't listen to dream killers. Hello? Don't listen, to, don't walk in the council means don't listen to the advice of the ungodly people. What are they gonna tell you? Those people that are not married tell you about marriage. What, what do they tell you? If they're not Christian, they don't have a Christian marriage, nothing is working for them. How are they gonna tell you how to live? Only God can do that, right? And of course, if you're walking with the Lord, one could give. But don't walk. The Lord is saying, blessed is the one that does not walk in the advice of the ungodly, who does not stand in the way of the sinners or sit in the seat of the mockers, but his delight is in the Lord. In Hebrews, in Hebrews 12, we read, and I don't have that verse for you. We are told that we are running a race, run the race with patience, looking unto Jesus. You know that one? Looking unto Jesus. Running a race. We all are, are running a race. And I think what, what, what the Lord wants us to know here is that, that we sometimes are being distracted while we are running. To do what? To slow down. Yeah, to slow down. This is a slowing down to listen to the other counsel. Yeah, listen to the counsel of godly people. Agreed. Many people, many counsel, I take advice, I talk to, I consult. Very important. But there is another thing that comes out from ungodly and ungodly living. Comes out. With, you're running a race, you're, you're serving the Lord, you're moving, and then you're being slowed down to a walk. You're being diverted from your calling and from your mission and passion. It is losing the momentum that has been gained in the things of the spirit. You walked and you ran so well, and then suddenly you listen to other counsel. It seems that we are being forced to, to slow down from a run, we are running a race, to a walk, walking to a point where you're listening to the ungodly advice, and to, to a point where you stop and stand in the way of sinners, now you're standing. You are running, you're walking now, you slow down to a walk because other people are saying something. You're, you're not running your dream and walking your dream and making that happen. Now you're slowing down, stopping, then you're standing and you're standing in the way of sinners, listening to the counsel that they give you. I tell you, I left my corner a long, long, long time ago. I know those friends were not going to add value to me. I walked away. Even so-called church people sometimes, they might not add value, so-called church people. But you'll have true sons of God who will help you, come alongside you, hold your hand. They will pray with you. They will do all that. But there'll be those that will put you down. You haven't gone through that, I'm sure. I can tell. And so, you, so you're running, then you start walking, uh, slowing down to a walk, and then you stand uh, hanging out with uh, these people, and then you find you sit down with them. Sit in the seat of the mockers. Sit down. That's what happens, and your dream is now killed, or is dormant, lying there, waiting for it to be resurrected. But it's not like that with the righteous, because the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The righteous are careful how they walk, where they stand, where they sit. We are talking about walking in our dream, and we are blessed because we delight in God's word. We meditate on it day and night. And that's not hard to do, by the way. So you got a mind. And you take one text and you think about it. It's like you got your plate of food, you take it, you don't just use a straw and pull all the rice in. 
I, I have to illustrate sometimes. I have to talk about food. It make you hungry, I know, but that's okay. You know, you take it. If you've got teeth, you put it in your mouth and you chew the silly thing, right? You chew, chew the living daylights out of it and then you swallow it, right? Some of you don't chew too much and too well. You get the Whatever, it's going in, right? Meditation is like that. You take the word and you chew it. Think about it. In, my, in all my talking, I'm, I'm giving you some pointers how to live. I woke up that morning, got that text, and I'm thinking about it. I read it a thousand times. Spoke about it for many, many, many scores of time. And then, but the Lord gave me another slant to it. And he highlighted one word, live. How do I get all that? Meditation. Thinking about it. Chewing on it. Why? Because God will use your mind. He will speak to you. Your word. His word. Because he wants to resurrect the dream. And then the, 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 the promise, the promise of those that meditate on the word of the Lord. He says, you, therefore, you will be watered. You'll be watered. You'll be like a tree planted by the streams of water. You'll be watered. You look watered. Do you know what it looks like to be watered? I, I, we know the difference. We look people and then, oh, man, there's, there's dryness here, you can tell. To be watered. God wants you to be fruitful. But you can't do that. You can't pick it up. You can't do that. It, it's not something that you can conjure up. Be, fruit, be fruitful. You can't be fruitful unless... You go into the word of the Lord, just uh, meditating, thinking about it, reading. Don't have to read chapters and chapters when you, you're yawning and all that. Let's take something simple, a hmm? few verses. I ask people sometimes that when they tell me, you know what, I read the Bible, I feel so sleepy, Pastor. So sleepy, I feel. I said, what time are you reading the Bible? Oh, I finish all the movies and all that, 11 o'clock. <laughs> For all that Bollywood and all that, it was perfect. Hmm? But I tell you, now, 11, 30, 12 o'clock, I'm opening the Bible. Of course, you'll feel sleepy then. And if you're sleeping in a horizontal position like this, you can sleep in any, any position <laughs> with the word of God. But so if you read, read something simple at an hour that is a little bit more, you know, because it's God's word that. Give honor to God now. That's worship, by the way. You sitting and listening like this, it's worship. It's worship. Worship is not just only when you... Worship is now sitting and listening. At, you, at his feet, listening. And so too when you go home, you, you take the word at whatever time you feel is convenient for you. You know, you look at one thing. It's maybe that one chapter, Psalm 1. Let's read that thing. Maybe meditate on that this week. Let's think about it. And he says, as you read it, you'll be like a person planted by the streams of water. You'll be watered. You'll be producing fruit pretty soon. You'll be forever growing and looking healthy. Then you'll be prosperous in whatever you do. You'll be prosperous. It's an automatic thing. It's the promise of God. Man will not live by bread alone. So both Psalms, and, and again, if you read Joshua, the same thing, Joshua 1. If you read Joshua 1 with Psalm 1, ah, you will see something. Go and read it. Why does meditation on the word bring such grand results? Because we're getting God's mind. Yeah, we're getting God's mind on matters. So if you have issues that you're praying about, then maybe you would want to find a text or maybe you pray. Lord, is there something in your word that I can meditate on concerning this? Because God's word is already spoken. Already spoken. It's there. And then God will use that to give you more. But wisdom on the matter for the day, for that week, in that situation, in that circumstance. Nothing can be worked out just by some counsel you get from somebody. It must be something that you and God, wisdom from God, God's counsel. You remember Joseph the dreamer? You remember him? Jacob's son. You know, I, I, this, this boy, amazing thing, he had a dream. And some of these dream things start early in your life. These gifts show up early in your life as a Christian. Then you know 
that this is what God has placed in your life. I was always a leader, always. I led things back in the world and in, and in the Lord, in the church, always. So it's something that this, I just gravitated toward. And there were always people gravitating toward me. It was the way it is, all the time. Before I had my own band, I had about two or three bands that I, that, that I led, even before I was 15. Won contests about that age too, with my band. You know that you're, you're leading, you, God placed something of leadership in you. So you hone the gift, hone it by studying, of course, reading, yeah, all of those things. And I find, find stuff in the Bible that's for me fascinating. Now, now, I believe what God wants us to do and as a land, what he wants us to work on is he wants us to work on our depth, yeah. You work on your depth while he works on your breath, how wide your, your ministry or life is going to go, the scope, how long it's going to be. You know, you work on your depth. This is so because, because the pursuit of your dreams, of his dreams, could take us through many a valley, you know. Ah, make no mistake, you, you and I are going to have roots that will... People that on, along the route that may be very hard. There will be struggles. There will be hardships. No one said it's going to be easy. I'm telling you, it's not going to be easy. There's a constant war. But there's a dream. I won the hill country. But yeah, like Caleb, he, was, he had to go with the other people around that mountain for 40 years. But he managed to live during that time and came back and said, I want that mountain. Still, I want that mountain. There might be people that have killed your dream. It's not over yet. If you're still awake and alive, God is able to resurrect it. You know, I tell you, this fellow, the dreamer, and you read all about his story, Jake, uh, Joseph. In, in Genesis 37, you read of how, how he, he dreamt that all his whole family will bow before him. That doesn't mean they will worship him. It means that they will, they will look to him for leadership in their lives. That he will lead. That's what he was dreaming. And he always dreamt. He was dreaming these things that was early in his life, before he was even 17. He was dreaming and his, and his brothers were mad with him. They hated him, hated they were dream killers, those brothers. Put him away, threw him in the pit, then sold him. But it's all oh, God's plan. If you don't let yourself down by, you know, sitting and getting discouraged and while well, you're getting mocked and sitting with the mockers and standing in the way of sinners, but you, you keep your heart and you work on your depth, I tell you, pretty soon you will rise. Because that dream thing happened for him in prison when he was falsely accused, put in prison. And they interpreted the dreams of those guys, which came to pass. And then he was, he was catapulted to the throne, uh, Pharaoh, and he uh, interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And he told Pharaoh the wisdom of the dream, how he must uh, take care of the people. That's when his whole family came, many all of them, and bowed before him and wanting food, he fed them. God had sent him. And then he also learned how to forgive. He lived a, a clean life, you know, clean life. Others can put you down. They can hate you. They can throw you in a pit. But you must be bigger than that. Because you will see the dream. The dream is bigger, see. The God has, is catapulting you. Is taking you to your place of destiny, whatever it is, is taking you there. And the way there is hard because people, some people are going to put you in the pit and you're going to get sold to some people and then go to that Egypt and be falsely accused, put in prison. And it's a long story sometimes. But whatever it is, whatever you go through, learn how to forgive. You know, Jesus on the cross, healthiest man that ever lived. Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. You know, we need to say that because people say things, they do things that will hurt you. And if you stand, 
stop running, start walking, and you stand, and then you want to throw stones at them, and fight, and defend yourself, then you'll find that you lose ground. You know, every time people throw rocks, they are losing ground. Hmm? Hmm. So the benefits of you being a Psalm 1 person, the dreams become very clear as you spend time in the word of the Lord. Your dreams become clearer. I know now I'm not supposed to be a doctor, but I can be a, a theologian. Eh? I can still be a doctor, right? I can even buy a certificate that says doctor. I mean, that's not... <laughs> By the way, I'm still doing my master's. It takes me so long to do this, but I'm studying. I'm going to finish one of, these days, one of these days. The dreams become clearer as you do it. And then you have seasonal fruit. Fruit will still be bearing. You'll be getting old and wrinkly, but there'll be fruit. Hmm? Their leaves won't fall. This is some one person. You still got vitality. You still, you don't lose momentum. You, even though young men will fall and all that, but those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. You will have the Midas touch. You know what a Midas touch? Everything that you touch turns to gold. That's what Psalm 1, Psalm 1 says. It says, whatever he does prospers. Does he say that? Verse 3, whatever he does prospers. Whatever he, you do, will, whatever you touch, man, God will bless it. You know, they say you've got green fingers. I don't care what business you might be into, but God is able to bless you if you've got someone under your belt. So let's pray for you. Stand with me, please.